Well, hello again, everybody. Welcome back to Walking Through the Scriptures with Joseph Bahoda. Today, I want to continue on another chapter in my book, Word of Faith Preachers, How Misinterpretation of Scripture Might Lead You Astray. And today, I want to talk to you about the topic of why are we building bigger church buildings, but not building people? Uh, now, this goes to a lot into the seeker-sensitive uh, movement that's out there. And if you haven't had a chance to look at my other videos, I actually did a video on the seeker-sensitive movement and why it's so devastating. Um, however, I don't talk about seeker sensitivity but I, in, the, in my book, but I do allude to it. And also, too, like I said in other videos, I, I, I wrote my book in 2010, but I got, got it published in 2011, praise God. Um, but around two or three years ago, so this was way after 2011, Ron Carpenter made a video. Now, this was after a school shooting that was actually in Florida. So this is not the shooting, unfortunately, that happened in Texas. Um, but this was a couple years ago. There was a school shooting in Florida. And Ron Carpenter asked a question. He said, you know, how come our church, and this is also before COVID, he said, how come our churches are bigger than they've ever been before? You know, our churches are bigger than they've ever been, but yet we're, our churches don't seem to be changing the culture of the world around us or a world around the church. So our churches are more filled than they've ever been. Our churches are bigger than they've ever been but we don't seem to be changing the culture. A couple months later, he got on TV and I believe the Holy Spirit gave him the answer. And he said, well, the reason we're not changing the culture is because the culture of the church is just like the culture of the world. Hello, seeker sensitive movement and all that. So I believe the Holy Spirit gave Ron Carpenter the answer. The problem is though, is Ron didn't go further because the next question should have been, okay, well then how did the church culture get there? How did the church get just like the world? And it's very simple because we became seeker sensitive. We, we cared more about what the world wants as opposed to what God wants. And quite frankly, we stopped preaching the gospel. Instead, we, we turned our churches into Dr. Phil, motivational speaker, make me feel happy, Tony Robbins, Dr. Phil type of you know motivational speaker, guru stuff as opposed to actually preaching the gospel, repent and turn from your sin. And that's why Jesus died for you. So we stopped preaching the gospel and we, we started giving the people what they want, which is exactly what the word, the Bible says when it talks about, and they will reap up teachers for themselves, preaching what they want to hear because the people have itching ears. And that's exactly what has happened in the prosperity gospel movement and the word of faith uh, even in the NAR and a lot of these new age churches that really aren't churches at all as far as Christianity, they're really new age and a lot of other things like that. So that is why. So what happens is you have all these mass, you know, thousands and thousands of people come into a church, which is why they believe they need a huge million dollar building to house and warehouse all these people. Um, and all we're doing is warehousing people. We're not really discipling people. We're not sending them out into all the world. We just send them to church and we reap all the money because after all, more people means more tithes and offerings and therefore the pastor gets richer and all that other kind of stuff. So what we're doing is we're building our own personal kingdoms and we're building our own personal empires instead of building, if you will, or adding to the kingdom of Christ. So we're not building the kingdom, we're building our own kingdom, our own empires and we're just using the church to do it, okay? So last week I talked about, is the prosperity gospel biblical? And obviously it's not. And we talked about how they misuse, you know, Matthew 5 and 13, where it talks about we are the salt and light of the earth. And we are, but they say the salt and light is wealth. That's not true, obviously. We also talked about how in Ephesians 3.20, where it says God can do more than you even ask or think. And that's true, he can, but there's a context to that, and that was talking about how you grow in faith, how you grow in your inner man, how you grow into the knowledge of God, how you grow into the height and the depth and the breadth and the and the height of the love of God, and that you would love and know Christ, and that love would pass this knowledge, and that you would be filled with the fullness of God. So doing exceedingly and abundantly more than we ask or think as it pertains to those things, not 
You know, if you're dreaming of a Mercedes, we'll dream of Lamborghini. If you're dreaming of Lamborghini, we'll dream of a private jet. If you're believing for a private jet, then believe God for a $40 million house. Whatever you can dream or imagine, God can do it. And granted, yes, God can do it, but that's not the context of that verse, okay? So prosperity gospel preachers preach that out of context. The other one they do out of context is Psalm 133 and 1, where it says, The anointing flowed down from Aaron's head all the way down to his beard, and running down through his garment, garments. And they, they misuse that to basically preach, see saints, you want your bishop to be wealthy. You want your pastor to be wealthy because whatever wealth is on him, that wealth anointing will trickle down to you. That's a total hot mess lie, but they preach that. And unfortunately I know because when I was pastoring in Iraq or co-pastoring in Iraq, I preached that too. So, cause that's how it was taught to me. So they misuse Psalm 133 and one. Another scripture uh, that they misuse is Deuteronomy 8.18. And it says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Now again, this is talking to the Jews under the old covenant as they're going into the promised land. Now if you read Deuteronomy, this is basically God reestablishing things with them. Because he's saying, hey, when you go into the promised land, don't forget me when you get blessed. Don't forget me when I bless you. Don't forget me when things are going well with you. Okay? So God is telling them, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear by your fathers, that is this day. Now remember, when God said this, he says, he gives you the power to get wealth. He didn't say that it's automatically going to happen. He just said he'd give you the power to get it. He didn't say that you're going to be wealthy just because you're saved and you're a king's kid, because I hear that a lot in prosperity gospel circles. See, I'm a king's kid, and I'm royalty, and I'm a prince, and I'm a princess, so I don't wear tattered clothes, and I don't I don't drive, you know, a hoopty. You know, I drive a Mercedes, and I fly first class, and I got my own private jets, and I got a five million dollar house. Because as a royalty person, you know, I, I don't I don't do that. You know, I'm a king's kid. Well. Explain that to 90% of the world who live in poverty and live in third world countries. Again, like I said in my last video, 90% of the world lives off of $3 less a day, including believers, okay? So this is very much an Americanized gospel, but not the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? The other one they take out of, out of context, and they, this, uh, Dr. Leroy Thompson is a big one on this one, and it's found in Psalm 35 and 27, and it reads, um, let's see if I can, if I can find it here, um, in his book, well, why I'm trying to find it in my book, Dr. Leroy Thompson has a book out called Money Cometh to the Body of Christ, and he uses these two ver verses as a backdrop to try to prove his point in his book, Money Cometh to the Body of Christ, and it reads, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may, that mayest prosper and be in health well, actually, this is actually 1 John. That's actually, excuse me, 3 John 1 and 2. But why I'm there, let me go ahead and do it. So 3 John 1 and 2. This is also another verse that he uses. It says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you mayest prosper and be in health, even as they soul, your soul prosperous. And see, they say, see that word prosperity. God wants us, beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper. So see, God wants us to prosper, saints. God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be wealthy. That word prosper there in the Greek means, I pray it goes well with you as if going along well with you as if in a journey, okay? So this is part of the salutation of the letter in 3 John, where John is basically saying, hey man, I, I pray all is going well with you, or I, I hope everything is going well with you as you read this letter, if you will. And in the NIV, if you read this verse in the NIV, it brings that interpretation out. This is that same verse in the NIV. I read you the King James earlier. This is the NIV. Now listen to the difference. It says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you. See, there it is. Even as your soul is getting along well. Saints, are you hearing the difference? This is why I like the NIV interpretation because it really reflects the Greek, I think, better. See, in America, when we hear the word prosper, we think money, unfortunately, okay? Now, when the King James Bible was written in, 16, in the 1600s, it may not have meant that. But now, in the 2000s in America, when we hear the word prosper, we think financial prosperity, we think money, we think wealth, what have you. 
But in the original Greek, that word prosper means to go along well with you as if in a journey. So when you read that text, it says exactly what it says here in the NIV. It says, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. There's nothing about that, about riches or wealth or finances or any of those things. But Dr. Leroy Thompson and a lot of these prosperity gospel preachers, they will say prosperity because that word prospers in there, saints. And they use that or misuse that to try to prove we need to be wealthy. Another verse Dr. Leroy Thompson uses in his book is Psalm 35 and 27. Okay. And it says here, it says, let them shout for joy. This is Psalm 35 and 27. Okay. And be glad that favor may favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And the Dr. Leroy Thompson's of the world are saying, see the Lord delights in the prosperity of his servant. Saints in the Hebrew, because again, Psalms is in the Old Testament, therefore it was written in Hebrew. Saints in Hebrew, the word prosperity there is the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. So it's really saying, let the Lord basically delights in the peace of his servants. And oh, by the way, if you read Psalm 35, that whole entire Psalm, David is basically praying unto the Lord that he would have, you know, basically reprieve or he would be delivered from his enemies. That's the whole context of Psalm 35. It has nothing to do with money, nothing to do with wealth, nothing to do with riches, none of that stuff. He's talking about having peace in the midst of one's enemies. So let me go back and read that again when you read it in the original Hebrew, if you will, with that word translated correctly. It says this, let them shout for joy. Shout for joy in what? In the midst of your enemies. Okay, because that's what the whole entire psalm is about. And be glad that favor my righteous cause. Why would God, you want God to favor you in your righteous cause? Because all these unrighteous people, if you will, all these doing unrighteous, unholy things around you, you have all these enemies around you, and you want God to favor you. Yea, or yes, let them be, say continually that the Lord may be magnified, which has pleasure in the peace of his servant, and especially peace in the midst of his enemies. Saints, that's what Psalm 35, 27 is saying. Has nothing to do with money, nothing to do with riches whatsoever. And oh, by the way, in 1 Timothy 6, 6, um, Paul has given Timothy instructions about what the wealthy saints are supposed to be doing. So I'm not against Christians having, having money. I'm not against Christians being wealthy. But even the wealthy saints, there's even instructions for wealthy people too. Like in 1 Timothy 6, it says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. So no matter where you are financially in your life, saints, we're supposed to have contentment. It goes on to say, for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we carry nothing out. And having food and remnant, let us be therewith content, okay? But they that will be rich fall into temptation and they snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Why? See, money brings temptation. Why? Because we can get greedy, and it brings lust for money, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Now, again, I like the way one preacher says it. It's not wrong for you to have you know, money as long as money doesn't have you. That's true. But the problem is the more money you get, the harder that that is. Because we, we have a tendency as fallen creatures to want to hoard what we've been given. So then Paul says this, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is all evil. But that's the problem. The more, the more money you get, the more you're tempted to love it. Okay, that's why it brings a snare. That's why Paul is saying this. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That's why Paul goes on to say, so in order to get rid of that temptation, be quick to share what you've been blessed with. Be quick to share with the poor saints in your congregation so you don't get caught up in these snares. So he's telling the wealthy, be quick to share and be generous and hospitable with your wealth. That way you don't get wrapped up in those, those money issues. Okay? That's what Paul says. So he doesn't say get wealthy to covet it. 
He says, get wealthy, if you will, not get wealthy, but if you are wealthy, use it to bless other people. So it's not about us so I can put a bumper sticker on my car that says favor ain't fair. No. Or on my Mercedes or on my Lamborghini that says favor ain't fair. Or have a little favor ain't fair on, on, on the doorpost of my door on my $5 million house. Or favor ain't fair as we put that sticker in our private jet. Saints, that's not the purpose for wealth. Paul says, be quick to be generous with your wealth so you bless the less fortunate within the congregation. Saints, we got this backward. These prosperity preachers, these word of faith preachers have it backwards. They're using it to build their own kingdoms. They're using it to build their own empires. They're using it to build their own bank accounts and make their own selves wealthy. Why the body of Christ is getting wrapped around the axle by this false teaching. Amen? Another thing that they do, there's three main things in my book that I talk about. Is the prosperity gospel biblical? Obviously, it's not. The other thing that they do is this health and wealth, which I'm going to talk about more. I have a chapter in here called Our Christians Gods with a small letter G, which leads to the whole name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, which also speaks to their whole you know, health and wealth. So if I have a sickness in my body, I can speak to my sickness and my sickness have to, has to leave. You know, and they use that scripture, you know, speak to the mountain and let the speak to the mountain say, be thou removed and cast into the sea and it's got to go. But there's also, if you, every time you hear that Jesus talk about praying and doing things in his name, he's always talking about, I only say what the father tells me to say and I only do what the father tells me to do. So even when we pray, it has to be aligned with the will of the father. It's not just name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, speak it into existence, and God, like a genie in a bottle, has to do it. No, our prayers have to align with the sovereign will of God. That's why it says in 1 John 5 and 14, this is the confidence, this is the confidence that we have if we say or pray anything according to his will. See, that's the key. If we pray anything according to his will, that God hears us, then we shall have what we say. Why? Because we're praying according to his will. So even when you speak to that mountain and cast into the sea, it's got to align with the will of God. If it doesn't align with the will of God, it's not going to happen. Okay? Or it doesn't have to happen. Why? Because God's not in it. But prosperity gospel preachers, word of faith preachers, the people that preach the, the, the health and wealth. Oh, I, you know, I'm not sick. And, and which was really weird because now you got people... For years, you had people in the body of Christ denying they had cancer. Well, the doctor said I have cancer, but I don't have cancer because I don't want to speak it into existence. Well, first of all, you don't have to worry about speaking into existence. Not that we even could anyway, but you don't have to worry about it because the doctor said you already have it. Okay, so what do they do? You have a whole bunch of Christians walking in denial saying, I don't have cancer. I don't have cancer. I don't have cancer. But every time they get an x-ray in the x-ray machine, it says there's cancer in their lungs or there's cancer in their body. They got a tumor in, you know, a cancerous tumor in their brain. So all the doctors are saying, you got it, but they're like, I don't have it. I don't have it. I don't have it. Why? Because they've been taught by these word of faith, speak it into existence, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, including our health, which I'll talk more about when I get to our Christian's God with a small G of how they even tried this, Kenneth Copeland tried to rebuke COVID and tried to kick COVID out of the earth. And here we are two years later and COVID is still very much here. So they, my point is saints, they can't do what they're saying. They can't do what they're teaching because what they're teaching doesn't work because what they're teaching is false. And deep down, they know it. So there's three main things that I tackle in my book. Now there's a lot of other things that prosperity gospel pre people preach and teach, but I only really tackle three in my book, prosperity gospel, health and wealth, and are we gods? Okay, with a small letter G. Because those three things kind of spawn off into the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. You know, and Kenneth Copeland used to say, money cometh to me. He believes he could manifest money coming to him just by speaking it. So he taught all the parishioners to do the same thing and the whole thing. This is the hot mess. So name it and claim it, which is, that's all spun off of the are we gods, health and wealth, and prosperity, i.e. riches. Okay, so they're, they're the three main things I tackle in my book. There's other false teachings that they teach, but those are the three that I teach in my book, okay? Or, or what they call health and wealth, or what they call trouble-free living. Well, I got a couple of scriptures here that blatantly would come against that. John 15 and 18. It says, if the world hate you, 
you know that it hated me before it hated you. That's Jesus talking to his disciples. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yes, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, even then, this is how they twist this. They will say, see, see all these people persecuting me by telling me how wrong my doctrine is. Like people like Joe right now and walking through the scriptures. You know, he's coming up against me because, you know, he's, he's teaching how what I'm teaching is wrong and what I'm saying is wrong and what I'm doing is wrong. So I'm being persecuted based upon what I'm teaching. So obviously as a prosperity gospel preacher, I must be right. See, they even twist 2 Timothy 3.12 to say, I'm as a wolf, I'm as a prosperity preacher, I'm as a false teacher of being persecuted. So therefore, I'm, my life is the persecution that that verse is talking about. As if somehow that gives validity to their wolfness. It, to give somehow gives validity to their false doctrine. Somehow gives validity to their false teaching. No, that's not what that verse is talking about. It's not talking about, you know, giving validity to the wolves. Wolves deserve to be persecuted because they're, they're false teachers. Okay? Here's another one. Acts 14 and 22. And that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So we're going to go through trials and tribulations. And if you really want to prove that, go back and read Romans 8. You know, where it talks about all the suffering that we're going to go through. And actually start, start at like around like verse 14. Because like verse 14 all the way through talks about, you know, pain and suffering. And talks about we are more than conquerors. Yeah, we're more than conquerors. But what's the context? Going through pain and suffering. That's why in Romans 8.26 it says, And the Holy Spirit will give us moaning and groaning and words that cannot be uttered. Why? Why is the Holy Spirit doing that? Because we're going through pain and suffering. So when it talks about in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good, for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Yeah, all things work together for good. That doesn't mean all things are good, but why do they work together for the good? Because some things are terrible, excuse me, and we're going to go through terrible things, but all those terrible things work together for the good, for those that are called and those who are called according to his purpose and those that love him. So Paul's telling us right there, we're not going to go through all good things. We're going to go through some terrible bad things. But even those terrible bad things work together for good for those that believe in Christ. So all those verses are pain and suffering verses. So all these people that teach health and wealth and trouble-free living and sweatless victories and we're never going to go through anything, they're false teachers. That's false teaching. It's not correct. Now, with all that being said, I want to close this section of my book. When I was in Iraq, and I was actually doing research for my book. In one of the classes I took, I had to do a survey. And I did a survey through the congregation that was in Iraq, through my fellow soldiers. And I basically asked them a whole bunch of questions. So I was gleaning and gathering research for my paper. And I didn't realize at the time, though, that I was going to be using that research for my book. So the next little section is basically the questionnaire that I gave the congregation. And in my book, I kind of expound on the question. So right now I'm just going to, and I did two, two separate surveys and I'm just going to give you some of the questions and I'm not going to give you everything that I expounded on for the sake of time, but I'm going to give you some of these questions to kind of get you to think of where I was coming from and why I gave them that particular questionnaire. And again, I gave them two questionnaires. And again, the title of this video is why are we building bigger church buildings and not building people? And my questionnaire was kind of geared toward that. So number one, are you, familiar, are you familiar with the prosperity gospel? Most people said yes. Do you believe some churches take advantage of people financially? Some people said yes. Do you believe that some preachers and churches exploit the poor and disfranchised? Yes. Do you think that some churches are too concerned about money and riches and material wealth? Yes. Do you believe that God desires for all Christians to be wealthy or rich? Some said yes, some said no. The congregation was divided on that one. Do you believe that most preachers are out to get your money? Some said yes, some said no. Do you believe that it is acceptable for preachers to live in million-dollar homes and drive luxury cars while the congregation lives paycheck to paycheck? Now, I said that one because, again, remember Psalm 133 and 1, because I was taught, you know, when the anointing flows down the beard and into the garments, that, it, that wealth anointing is going to flow on the people in the pews. So that question, come, which is a false teaching, but that question comes out of that. Number eight, do you believe in going to church where the building costs millions of dollars to build, but the people who paid for it live paycheck to paycheck? Is that okay? Number nine, 
Do you believe that money that was used for million dollar buildings could be used for better things like giving back to the congregation and paying off their bills? Just the thought. Why do I say that? Because in Acts chapter 2, it says they sold everything that was in their possessions and they gave it to the apostles and they laid it at the apostles' feet and they took care of the people in the congregation so nobody in the congregation had a need. And oh, by the way, if you read the book of Acts, it says, and they went from house to house, breaking bread, continuing in the apostles' doctrine. So the early church saints met in homes. They didn't meet in these huge million-dollar ed edifice buildings. They met in their homes, which they already had. Just something to throw out there. I got a couple of teachings on that too, about the early church and how the early church started. Go back and watch some of our early videos. I got some of that on there too. Number 10, do you believe in tithing 10% of your income to the church? And again, I got a whole bunch, of, whole bunch of videos on tithing. Go back and check that out. Do you believe that when... <clears throat> oh, let me, let me go back to this. It says, do you believe in tithing 10% of your income to the church? Why do I say to the church? Because ultimately when you tithe, that's how you tithe too. Again, like I said... The Father is in heaven. Jesus is in heaven. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit and he lives in us. It ain't like Jesus is in the back with the deacons getting his, getting his cut after service is over. No. So God never physically gets the money. So the ones who get the money is your local church. Now, I, I, you think that's simple, but I, I, I said that question. I said, do you believe in giving 10% of your income to the church? You would not believe how many people responded with, no, we don't give it to the church. We give it to God. You have no idea how many people actually responded with that. Well, God, again, God never gets it. Again, the only thing he gets, he can see your obedience. He can see your faith. He can see your sacrifice. He can see your act of worship and reverence by giving your tithe. But he doesn't actually physically get it. The money goes to your church. And then the church uses that to pay off its bills. So all God does is sees, he sees and he... He receives, if you will, your act of faith and obedience, but he doesn't, he doesn't actually receive the money. Your local church does, but a lot of people responded with, no, God gets it. Saints, no, he doesn't. Number 11, do you believe that you will be cursed if you do not tithe? Number 12, do you believe that some preachers are, use scare tactics in order to get people to give money? Number 13, do you believe that some preachers take scripture out of context and twist it to make people give money? Number 14, do you believe that there are fraudulent preachers out there today? Number, number 15, if you, are, if you answered yes to the question above, do you believe that this is widespread? Number 16, do you believe that it's wrong for a Christian to be rich? Okay, which again, I, I don't, but as long as you give and have a generous spirit. Number 17, do you believe that Jesus taught on being poor and taught his disciples to do the same? Why or why not? Number 18, do you believe that Jesus taught on being rich and taught his disciples to do the same? Why or why not? Do you believe in divine healing? Again, this is the health and wealth. Do you believe that God heals everybody? Do you believe that God wants all believers to be rich, wealthy, healthy, and, and, and stress-free? If you answered yes to the, the above questions, do you believe that God promises believers all these things? Number 22, do you believe that some Christians have taken the Bible to make it what they want or what they wanted it to be in order to have all these things? That was my first survey. I came back with a second survey. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and read the question. But one of the questions I had was, if we do find fraudulent preachers out there, or they are doing bad things with the money, are we allowed to say anything? Or are we allowed to bring it up? Are we allowed to make them accountable? And the, surprisingly, the church was very... I can't really say surprising. The church was very, very divided on that. Why? Because in these prosperity gospel circles, they also teach, you know, do not touch God's anointed, which, which is another way of saying to them, you're not allowed to speak against the preacher. You're not allowed to speak against the pastor. You're not allowed to speak against the bishop. So do not touch God's anointed is a silencing tactic to get people to not bring anything up, which just establishes a culture to where these wolves can do whatever they want to do. Okay. This is not Bible. When it says, do not touch God's anointed, in context there, that was King David saying, or, well, he wasn't even king yet. King Saul was still king, and David had the capacity to kill King Saul, but he decided not to do it. He physically could kill him because King Saul was going to the bathroom or whatever, and David came up behind him, and he cut the hem of his, his, his clothing off instead of slitting his throat like he could have. 
So when David said, I will not touch God's anointed, that was David saying, I won't physically kill King Saul. It had nothing to do with speaking against false teaching when you hear it. But however, that's how these prosperity gospel word of faith preachers use that scripture to basically silence people in the pews. And that's out of order, okay? But because of that, even people, my point is, even people who don't believe in prosperity gospel and they don't believe in health and wealth and they don't believe in word of faith teaching, they still were brainwashed into, I'm not allowed to say anything. That is why when I, I, when, I, when I asked that question, some of the responses I was getting was, yeah, you could speak up. Or some people were saying, no, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to speak up because that's between them and God. And since it's between them and God, you know, whatever I, what, as long as I'm, I'm obedient to giving, as long as I do what I'm supposed to be doing with the money, God's going to take care of them. And don't get me wrong, God will take care of them. But the Bible also says in 1 Timothy 5, it says, do not bring an accusation against an elder unless you have two or three witnesses. And then if you have two or three witnesses that can be confirmed, it says take that elder and rebuke him in front of the whole entire congregation so the fear of the Lord will be brought back to the people. I'm going to say that again. If those accusations can be found true, it says take that elder and rebuke him in front of the people so the fear of the Lord will be established. Saints, do we do that? Absolutely not. So some of these pastors should have got rebuked in front of the whole congregation years ago. But why won't they do it? Because the pastor started the church and there's zero accountability and all the elders are brainwashed into the so-called awesomeness of the pastor. So they ain't nobody going to rebuke him because no, nobody know any better. It's literally the blind leading the blind. So he's never going to be rebuked from his elders because they believe he's the anointed man of God. And they also teach that that wealth and health and you know money and jets and cars and houses, that's all part of the favor of God. So the more money I have, it's got to be true because look how, look how God is favoring me. Well, what they're also indirectly saying is, well, if I don't have money, then there must be something wrong with your Holy Ghost. There must be something wrong with you because you're not big pimping like me. So the reason you don't have you don't have all this like with like I do is because God's not favoring you. So there's something wrong with your faith, or there's something wrong with your Holy Ghost. See, if you had the Holy Spirit like I do, or if you had the faith to believe God like I do, you could be big pimping like me. But since you're not big pimping, there's something wrong with you. And both those things, saints, are false. Okay, but you'd be surprised when I ask that question. You know, are we allowed to say anything? And some people said no. Why? Because they've been brainwashed into the do not, you know, do not uh, touch God's anointed, which is them using that scripture incorrectly. So anyway, when I gave my second survey, I says, are you familiar with the prosperity gospel? What is the prosperity gospel to you? Um, what is your definition? Do you think that some churches are too concerned about money? Uh, three, do you believe that God desires for all Christians to be wealthy? I just kind of reiterated a lot of these questions. Um, let's see, I'm not going to go through all, all of them. Um, just kind of going through them again. So anyway, I just kind of re-entered, re-entered a lot of those questions, but it, again, I just want to bring up that one difference when I said, do you believe we're allowed to say anything? And you'd be surprised that how the body of Christ was all over the place on that. So I hope that you can see the prosperity gospel is, is not, um, is not biblical at all. And unfortunately we are building churches and huge buildings instead of building people in a lot in a lot of cases and I want to close with this years ago there was a pastor in Tampa named Zachary Timms okay now he, he he was pretty famous he got pretty high up there he was on TBN and stuff all the time and to make a long story short Zachary Timms died he had a so he had a lot he apparently he had a lot of vices and he died of a cocaine overdose, apparently with some hookers in a hotel room in Tampa or something like that. I don't know exactly what happened, but he died. And, you know, God rest his soul. Um, but anyway, he left a wife named Reva Timms and four children behind. I believe it was four. And when he died, Reva Timms was interviewed on TBN and she said, and she said something that was right. She said, and this is what I've been saying in this video, she said, Unfortunately, we've been using the church to build our own kingdom 
And we've been using the church to build our own empires. So she said, you know, no more celebrity pastors. And she's absolutely right. She's absolutely right. So what she said was right, but then she followed it up by being wrong. Because later, now keep in mind, the church kicked her out. Um, and, you know, and she said, you know, I'm the real true mother of this church. Um, and as you know, pastors or females are not supposed to be pastoring over men. So if she was trying to take over the church, she was wrong anyway. Um, but what should have happened is the church should have took care of her in some kind of way. But they didn't. They kicked her out. And they replaced Zachary Timms with Paula White. One, a female pastor, so they were out of order there, number one. And number two, they replaced Zachary Timms with the biggest, hottest celebrity pastor, famous name they could get, Paula White. So they were out of order because they elected a woman to be a pastor, and they were out of order, number two, because they played the fame game Instead of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit was saying to do. Not that you play the Holy Spirit, but you understand what I'm saying. They decided to go with carnality and flesh and fame and who could draw the bigger crowd because of the name as appointing a man who had the Holy Ghost to take over the church. So them elders were wrong. And this was about 10 years or so ago. So maybe they, maybe they repented by then. But at the time they elected Paula White, Every single one of those elders should have resigned. Every single one of them. Unless they were came up against it and those elders got, you know, basically shot down and they didn't go with their vote. But if all the elders were on board with Paula White, every single one of them should have, should have resigned. One, because they were out of order because they disobeyed the scriptures, electing a woman as a pastor. And number two, they were out of order because they played fame as opposed to what the Holy Spirit was saying. Every single one of the elders should have resigned. But... That's what happened. Now, so what happened to the Reva Tims? Apparently, then she moves out of Tampa and she moves to Orlando and then she, she, she starts her own church in Orlando. Now, I don't know if she has men in that church. She probably does. But if she has men in that church, she's out of order now too. So my point of that is you can say the right thing and still be wrong in your actions because she said no more celebrity pastors. That's correct. She also said, we, unfortunately, we were using the church to build our own kingdoms and we're building our own empires. Well, he hello, Reva, Pastor Reva. You are his wife, right? So you went along with this. So if your late husband was building his own empire, building his own brand, building his own name, building his own empire and kingdom, and you were his wife, at the very least, didn't you at least go along for the ride? Which means at the very least, going along, weren't you at least going along for the ride out of order and sinful and wrong? Yeah. Yeah. So my point is, she was right in what she was saying. Unfortunately, we were building buildings. We were building bishops. And we were, you know, we had all these churches under us, and we had all these churches in different locations. We were building our own empire. We were building our own kingdom and we were using the church to do it, which also meant we were building our brand. We were building our celebrity. We were building our fame. We were building our name. We were networking. We were building ourselves up. We were building our own kingdom and not the kingdom of God. And we were using the church to do it and building our own financial portfolios and our own bank accounts and our own millions and our own finances and our own wealth and our own prosperity. But we weren't necessarily building the kingdom of God and we weren't necessarily building people. So she said all the right things. She was right in what she said. But then her actions didn't align with what she said. So, and you'll see that a lot. A lot of these wolves, they'll say the right things sometimes. Well, sometimes they won't. That's why they're wolves. But other times they, they might say the right thing, but their actions don't back up what they're saying. And I see it time and time and time and time and time and time again. No more celebrity pastors, but it's come, but they are a celebrity pastor. You know, that's like saying, you know, that's like saying if, if T.D. Jakes were to say that. No more celebrity pastors, but you're a celebrity pastor. Come on now. No more celebrity pastors, but now your daughter, Sarah Jakes, is a celebrity pastor because of you, T.D. Jakes. 
So now your daughter is basically pimping your coattails. She's pimping your name so she can be famous. Same thing, same thing, same thing. So we're building our own kingdom. We're building our own empires. We're building our own brand. But are we building people? Anyway, saints, that's why I did the survey in my book. That's why I, I gave that out to the people in the congregation. Um, again, I was just trying to use that information and survey for my paper. I had no idea that was going to be in this book, you know, years later, and it was going to help me get my PhD, thank God. Um, but those, those are some of the questions that I put in the survey. So, Saints, that covers the first 133 pages of my book. <laughs> so I'm going to stop there. My, my next video, I'm going to talk about more erroneous teaching that prosperity gospel people use to want us wealthy. We, we, we've only touched the surface of all the scriptures they use out of context. There's more. And I'm going to talk about that in my next chapter of my book. Anyway, if this, if this teaching has blessed you, please feel the share. I know it's a little long today. But please hit the share button. Please hit the share it with other people. Please hit the like button. Please hit the red subscription button. So um, please be a subscriber. Share this with everybody. Let people know this information is out there. Share this with other people so they can get the truth of God's word out there. And again, just truly, truly, you know, be blessed in the Lord. But please get this out there so I can get on the YouTube algorithm so I can get the truth of God's word more and more out there. Okay, so share it. Hit the like button, hit the, hit the red subscription button, and know that Jesus loves you, and I do too. So until next time, God bless.